teenagers sitting in Emmanuel Methodist Church when he preached and gave the altar call and I walked up to the altar and gave my life to the Lord. I was 15 when he baptized and confirmed me and I remember standing in the baptismal pond with him at Emmanuel Methodist Church and he looked at me and said, Cecil, don't worry, I'm strong. If I take you in, I'll bring you out. And over the years, I have just f followed him, uh, just loved to see the way in which he has poured himself out for the Lord's work, faithfully, with great integrity. For 22 odd years, he was vice president at World Vision with the mandate to just go and preach the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth, to look after pastors and prepare them and teach and equip them. And how well he did that, going to places that not many people would go to. I remember when I was in seminary meeting a couple of students from Romania, and they spoke in awe of him because they said that he would come to Romania when it was even dangerous to his life to do so. But he kept going there, preparing the pastors for a time <clears throat> when the Iron Curtain would come down. <clears throat> Post then, he has done phenomenal work traveling across the world. He's the president and founder of Friends Missionary Prayer Band, an indigenous missions movement that has just done wonderful, wonderful work in India. But you know, if Paul, uh, if uh, the writer of Hebrews had his Hall of Fame, in my Hall of Fame, Reverend Kamalason is one. And it's such a joy this morning to welcome you, Pastor, to our midst. It's a delight to have you here. And our hearts are filled to just uh, look forward with anticipation to what God has in store for us through you. I asked him whether he would sing and he graciously agreed. And so I know we're in for a treat this morning. Would you welcome Dr. Sam Kamalesan? If it is such an awe and uh, thrill for Cecil to introduce me, it is greater awe and thrill for me to be here. I had wanted to be here because I had heard about you due to your connection with Cecil. And um, for years, Bombay seemed to be out of my way. I came to India often, but I went out of India another way than Bombay. But this time, by the will of God, I am here. So I'm thrilled to be where Cecil is, and hence where you are. Is that all right with you? Well, good. Cecil said I should sing. And uh, I consented because we were just traveling in the car and I had been with him for just a few minutes and I couldn't say no to him. And then I found that I will be singing a cappello. And um, if I slip out a key, you would blame it on your pastor, would you? <laughs> no one, absolutely no one, ever cared for me like Jesus. No one can, because no one knows me as he does. And no one loves me as he does. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life 
completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take my sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and oh, Jesus placed his kind and loving arms around me and he led me in the way I ought to go. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love, but I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take my sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. Well, Oh, thank you. Thank you. Will you pray with me? And Lord, we thank you that there is a givenness in this worship time. And that is your promise. Where two or three are gathered in your name, you are among them. We are in a building in this big city called Mumbai, we could be easily ignored. But Lord, you are not ignoring us. You are among us. We pray that the blessed Holy Spirit will open the eyes of our hearts to see you. That he will open our ears that we may hear you and then Lord he will help our will to yield to you that what we see and what we hear will become permanently part of us Lord Jesus we love you we thank you and we pray this prayer in your name for your own sake, Lord Jesus. Amen. The city where I was a pastor and your pastor was among those who worshipped there, that city has a rather beautiful beach. It used to be prettier, but it's being more populated now. We call it the marina, and uh, 
when you come to Chennai, you must see the marina. In the evenings, people go out <coughs> in large numbers to get a whiff of the fresh, quote-unquote, sea breeze. And then the peanut vendors come with uh, burlap sacks. They have varieties of peanuts. The hot ones, the sweet ones, the sugar-coated ones, they just endless variety. And they will sell it to you. Our man was a peanut vendor at the beach in Chennai. He had been selling peanuts for many years. To his satisfaction, he was the president, the vice president, the secretary, and the treasurer of his peanut selling concern. But to be honest, he had to own that this peanut selling concern, of which he was the president, the vice president, the secretary, and the treasurer, was a bankrupt peanut selling concern. Disturbed him. And he didn't know how to redeem himself from this. So finally he decided that the offending part of the whole transaction was the wheelbarrow with the peanuts in it. So he pushed it behind a bunch of cana along the beach. We do have, just for uh, um, beauty, cana of various colors. And he pushed it behind that, dusted his hands, and decided he had a new self-image. He went to a sidewalk cafe, sat at the table, ordered the most expensive fare. The waiter knew our uh, peanut vendor's antecedents, but he decided it's a free country if he wants to eat himself to deeper bankruptcy. That's his business. When he went in to prepare fare, a new arrival came, dressed in immaculate steel gray business suit, a white shirt, a lovely businessman's tie. This guy looked as if he could sell the Taj Mahal. He came and asked our peanut vendor, can I share your table? My, the peanut vendor thought my new self-image is working. They are asking me permission. Loftily, he said, help yourself. The man sat down. He was in a talkative mood. So he said, sir, what do you do for a living? Our peanut vendor said, I'll have you know, I am a businessman and I'm the president, vice president, secretary and treasurer, the sole owner of my business. The new arrival appeared terribly impressed. He said, Providence made me meet you. Look at all your experience, President, Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer. I have capital that I want to invest in this city. With your experience, if you and I become partners, we can take the city. The peanut vendor thought, man, this guy is something else. But he didn't want to give himself cheaply. After all, you are a president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Who cares if it is bankrupt? Are you listening? Who cares? After all, every guy is bankrupt. So he said, sir, I don't talk business with strangers. You haven't told me who you are. The man apologized profusely. 
He said, sir, I thought you seen my picture in the front page of India's dailies and weeklies. I am a frequent visitor to India. In fact, I have recruited people from India to work for me around the world. But that is no reason for me not to tell you who I am. He said, my name is, my name is, he said, my name is Bill Gates. What do you think the peanut vendor did? You'll have to wait till I finish preaching. <laughs> Honestly, I intended to do that. You'll have to wait till I finish preaching and then I will tell you the rest of the story. In Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 14 on to verse 20, there is a passage that deals with the calling of God. This is where the first call for the first four disciples takes place. People who have assessed the four Gospels tell us that Mark qualifies to be a modern-day journalist. Terms like straight away, immediately, or Markan terms, and they would fit in with what this morning's newspaper will say. He, Paul Mark knows how to captivate our attention and keep it there. In the 14th verse, Mark says, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee. Mark would like to set the stage. A ministry of the forerunner was over. Now it is time for the Messiah to come in. And Jesus enters. Jesus enters Galilee of the Gentiles. God is not looking for the purity as conceived by human beings. He is looking for human beings as seen by God. Mumbai is a classic example of what God will consider a worthwhile place to invest himself in. I am very impressed with the big city. You, you may not agree for all the reasons that I have for being so impressed because you are dealing with it every day. But it is a wonderful city, powerful city. It's also difficult to breathe, but that's all right. Some things have to go with the good things. Jesus came. How did he come? He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. There is no private salvation that Jesus preached. Personal salvation, yes. He's interested in you. He's interested in me. And we may be different from each other. But he is interested in persons. But it's not a private salvation. Salvation, as it is in the Gospels, is a kingdom affair. It is a rule of God. It is the displacement of my rule with his rule. And it takes a lifetime of understanding how one yields to the other. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What was the content? Four things. Time is now. You can't postpone it to tomorrow. You cannot. We may succeed in thinking that we can postpone, but it's impossible to postpone the impinging reality of the kingdom. The kingdom is now. It's upon you now. Don't think that it is me who is acting urgently. 
The kingdom is demanding that urgency. You can't postpone. If you're postponing, you haven't heard the kingdom yet. Time is now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, now. The second thing that Jesus preached was, the kingdom of God is pressing in on you. The demand that you know and respond to the rule of God is pressing in on you. It's not stories, it's not interesting anecdotes, all of them may play a role, but ultimately the point of interception is my will versus his will. Why did he give me a will? He probably will try to explain to me so that you will yield to my will. The choice will be I now will your will. Help me. The kingdom of God is at hand. What should I do? What is the action? Repent. Turn around. Because the direction you are going is totally the opposite one. The desires you have are totally in disagreement. Not just disagreement. They are set against the tendencies of the kingdom of God. Prestige is a non-issue in the kingdom. And yet, prestige is the one issue for which most of our society lives. The consciousness of prestige in our Indian society is at a very high level. Servanthood is the quality of the kingdom of God. We don't know how to build others, enable others to become what they want to become. And yet kingdom people do that to one another. That's just a little taste why I should repent. Turn around, you're going in the wrong direction. Then believe. For what you don't see, trust. It'll happen. Keep moving. It will happen. Four things. It is now. There's a kingdom. There's a rule. Turn around. You need to. Nobody else can do this for you. It's a 180 degree reversal. And then, for what is ahead, believe, move, trust, and it will happen. But he didn't leave it like that, take it or leave it proposition. He called people into this. Simon, Andrea, Jacob, Johan, two sets of brothers. And they responded. They, true to what has been called for, left what they had and began to follow him. Jacob and Johan gave up servants. They were a little bit better off than Simon and Andrew. And they left servants, the polished style of life, and followed Jesus Christ. Four things in this transaction. One, there is an announcement about the kingdom. Two, there is an intimacy. You, me, let's go. What about my wife? I'll take care of her. I'm talking to you. You, me, let's go. He still does that. And then there is a promise. I hesitate and I say, I don't have the wherewithal to become what you think I can become. He says, I'll make you. And then he says there is a consequence. What is the consequence? You will begin 
to attract people in Mumbai, you will become fisher of men. Doesn't mean that you will resign your bank job and go fishing for people. But while you are a banker, you will become a fisher of men too. School teacher, your primary job would be to win people to Christ. And you will play bills by teaching at a very high level. No mockery. The efficiency would increase. I will make you fishers of men. That offer is still made to you and to me. They paid a price. We pay a price too. I didn't realize when I first came face to face with Jesus Christ what was in store down the road for me. A classmate of mine led me to Christ. He was a Hindu. His name was Shankar Narayan. Shankar, when he found the Lord, was a radiant person. To him, Jesus was a risen, immediate reality whose influence he felt in his life. And some of the other students, other than the non-Christians, the guys who were members of congregations in that part of the world, thought it rather funny that Shankar would be so obviously celebrating the presence of Christ. Now, in reflection, I think that they were put under conviction. If one can know this Christ so intimately, what are they doing? Generations, they had been members of the church, but everything had gone dull. No reality. Church attendance was part of the mundaneness of the total life. I was also among them, but I enjoyed Shankar, and so I defended him. I took these guys, India has a lot of dogs, doesn't it? No? Nobody owns these dogs. But they thrive. Don't they? Not in Mumbai? You don't talk on Sunday morning, do you? <laughs> don't they thrive? They're, and if a stray new dog comes into that neighborhood, all of them will get together and go after this new one. I don't know how they incorporate him finally into their gang, but there's a lot of barking and noise making, and you can't sleep. These guys were something like that. They were disturbed by the reality in the light of life of Shankar. And they made a lot of noise. Noise that was not relevant to the Jesus that Shankar was talking about. We were in a government farm during summer undergoing personal training. My first training was in veterinary medicine. I don't know if you knew that. That means if any one of you has a headache There you go. I thought I lost you. That's good. I am a veterinarian. Shankar radiated the love of Jesus. And I pulled these guys one by one and I told them, next time I catch you, my fist. That's what I could do. I didn't know the Jesus Shankar knew. 
in a government farm. After we finished the day's work, we were both walking together. I wanted Shankar to pray for me because I thought God will answer if he would recommend me. In India, everything is recommendation. Why not get a guy to recommend you to God? Nothing better than that. Shankar readily agreed because he had been praying for me. And he said, I'll be glad to pray for you. But he said, Sam, are you a Christian? It kind of shook me up. You see, I'd been defending this guy, feeling good about it. He had been a Christian only a few months. He's trying to challenge me, who had a genealogy of at least five generations of Christians. I told him all of that and topped it off by saying, my name is Samuel and it comes from the Bible. He said all of them were good, but not any one of them made me a Christian. I said, what word? He said, Sam, you need to be born again. You need to be born into a value system that's totally different. You need to be born of the Spirit. God himself will indwell you. I thought it was very logical. I asked him for scripture. He took me through the third chapter of John's Gospel. A man, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, was being told by Jesus, you must be born again. The rationale was, if it was true for Nicodemus, it certainly is true for me. We knelt underneath a tree and we began to pray. When I got up on my, off my knees, I had invited Christ into my heart. And a walk began that day that has not ended yet. Changed me. My ambitions and desires were changed. Walking down the crowded path of uh, Porosawakam. Now that, 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 that's a, probably a tongue twister, but it's a part of Chennai, rather crowded part of Chennai. Walking down the streets of Porosawakam, Jesus talked to me and said, hey, don't you think these people around you need to know me? I said, of course they should. Then he said, you tell them. Somebody has to tell them. You tell them. I said, I can't do that. They are going in 20 different directions. How can I stop them? He said, sing. They will stop. I said, here in the street? He said, yes. I said, no. He said, why not? I said, they'll think I'm a fool. Now here's the answer he gave me. You're already a fool. <laughs> After you have left, let me give you the reason that he gave me. If you tell anybody that you are now indwelt by Jesus Christ, the first thing they think is, what a fool. They may not tell you that. It de depends how well bred they are. What a fool. What a stupid fool. That's what he was referring to. You don't have to be known as a fool because you sing. You are known as a fool because you claim submission to me. I had no way to wiggle out of him. So I found a dustbin. Not too many self-respecting people are found around dustbins. And I stood there, closed my eyes. It was desperately destructive 
to do what I was asked to do. Then I sang. When I opened my eyes, there was a crowd standing there. In India, if two dogs fight, a crowd will gather. So it's, it's not difficult to gather a crowd. Now I had to do something. I said three things. I said, He, Yesu, is alive. Two, I have found that He is alive. Three, you also can find that He is alive. Everything inside of me dried up. I had said what I needed to say. Now I got to escape this crowd. I tried to push my way to get out. A man caught a hold of my hand and he said, I want to know. Tell me. I was totally surprised. You will be too. Try some way to throw a, a line into the crowd in Mumbai. You will be surprised there are people anxiously waiting to discover whether Christ is alive or not, whether he can do anything to them personally or not. We haven't tried. Most of us are used to expressing our faith, our testimony within protected environment. Am I right or wrong? then why don't you talk to me? Because I didn't ask you to talk, isn't it? Are you there? Are you listening? Yes. We don't. We don't like the discomfort of being exposed. It's raw. It could get nasty. Why invite trouble like that? This fellow held on to my hand and said, tell me. So I sat at the edge of the sidewalk and had a hip pocket New Testament. I pulled it out and showed him verse after verse. The guy ate it up. I couldn't feed him enough. I took his address, ran back to the guys I had led to the Lord, living with me in the college. And I gathered them and I said, there's plenty of fish outside. Let's go fishing. Three and a half years after that, we went regularly into the streets. Sometimes three times a week. It was there that he tapped me on my shoulder and said, I want you. Come, follow me. Oh, they told me, if you come to this part again, we'll break every bone in your body. I, I did go. Not any bone is broken yet, unless you break some in Mumbai. God is with you when you obey Him. Something changes in you so radically that only obedience can lead you into that. Fascinating, wandering, and uh, imagination running wild all of that are great, but obedience, one step of obedience will lead you into an enormous, unending pathway of change, transformation in your life. I did graduate as a veterinarian and then went to theological studies. And had the distinction of being a pastor of a church. But all of that, simply to say, he, when he says he will make you, he is faithful and true in transforming you. And the result is, you too become a fisher of men. In this um, passage in Mark, 
Come after me and I will make you become fishers of men is the direct invitation to you and to me. You don't have to become a pastor, but you will become a fisher of men. As a doctor, lawyer, banker, teacher, student, whatever you are, God will use you to bring people to a personal knowledge of himself. And his invitation this morning is for that kind of an engagement. I left Bill Gates, didn't I? You forgot Bill Gates? I don't, I don't have to tell the story again, do I? No. He said, who are you? And the man said, I'm Bill Gates. You would think that a bankrupt peanut vendor in the beach in Chennai would have sense enough to know this is an opportunity that may not repeat itself and would jump up and say, where do I sign? Where is the contract? Not so, because there was another voice speaking inside the peanut vendor. And that voice said, be careful. If you sign with this guy, he will want to be the president. <laughs> hey, after you laughed, give it a second thought. He will want to be the president. The most you can be is a vice president. Whereas with your wheelbarrow, man, you are the president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, no challenge. You are now thinking, aren't you? What is it that God is asking of you and me when he says, follow me and I will make you sensible people stop and think and say, hey, the problem with you, God, is that you want to play God in my life. I would like to attend church, sing lustily, and even give testimony, but I don't want anybody else to play God in my life. Now you're not laughing. I hope you're thinking. In a little while, the pastor will invite us. This is the body that was broken for you. Take it in remembrance that he died for you. This is the blood that was shed for you. Drink in remembrance that he shed the covenant blood for you. What is the deal? God, be God in my life. Change me. Transform me. There are desires that hold me that are contrary to my relationship with you. Please transform me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me whole. God, come and be God in my life. The man is still selling peanuts and he's still bankrupt. But he's got a feather in his crown. To anybody who talks to him, he says, Hey, did you know that I turned a Bill Gates down? You have a feather too. I turned the Son of God down. We can't say it boastfully. We got to say tearfully, too long, Lord, forgive me. Not today. Would you like to pray with me while I close? In 
some measure, blessed Savior, I've been paying, playing the fool. You have come near to me so often. I knew that. I knew that it was you. I even felt the brush of the hem of your garment against my face. I knew it was you. But Savior, it's difficult for me. I want to play God in my life. This morning, I know the deal does not include that clause. There's only one God. There's only one who is the Son of God. Only one Redeemer. Only one Savior. Help me this morning. Help me when I come to celebrate that you gave yourself for me. Please, Lord, may the transaction, may the covenant be real. Come. Please rule in me. Come. Transform the city and use me as you will. We, my brothers and sisters and I, pray this prayer in the name of God's Son, our blessed risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. For the body of people here, that Amen was rather feeble, wasn't it? Would you like to do it again? Amen is not for the pastor to say. It's for you to say, because Amen means, so let it be. Let's try it one more time. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. That's better. God bless you.